it's an animal. I've never been compared to a sausage maker before, but uh, as you explained, and I really like that, uh, and I feel very grateful to that, uh, for that comment in terms of creating institutional spaces. Um, and that's something that's very important. Um, this, I was reminded by um, Professor Tsai that this is the third time I've been at Conchurum University. Uh, last May and other times I've been, I've been here to speak or to participate. And so it's very, it's a very a great pleasure to come back uh, to this university in particular. And, uh, and I thank, the, I thank the, both of the coordinators for this, uh, for this opportunity. But also, I'm looking forward to just listening and, and participating. What I'm going to give is, um, is basically trying to rework or rethink the relation of the animal and the human world that uh, has become the center of a lot of debates in the humanities or the post-humanities. In thinkers like uh, uh, Roberto Esposito, uh, Giorgio Agamben, uh, Gary Wolf, um, Jacques Derrida, and others. And so I want to kind of open up that uh, small passage out of Heidegger's early seminars in 1929-1930 about the proposition that the animal is poor in the world, poor in the world, and uh, to start to kind of rethink the way that we understand that relationship with humans. So in the open, man and animal, Giorgio Agamben structures the relationship between man and animal according to a thesis concerning what he calls the anthropological machine. What kind of machine is this? In fact, it is the polis, the city, which is a privilege that has always, at least from Greek thought, from Aristotle onward, even earlier from Homer, is a very privileged anthropological machine. And it's described fundamentally as a machine. Perhaps there would be no such thing as either man or animal, for that matter, were it not for the polis, which is a particular porous, poros place, fructus as in production, orifice, which spits both forms out onto the earth. It begins simply as a metrical machine of home. The city is a structuring of language and crossing um, which differentiates the phonocentric understanding of the animal cry from the human speech. With the Caesera, it is, becomes in Aristotle a column or category that appears, that appears to define and to classify the different species of man and animal, diversity of species. But according to Agamben, Agamben's famous or infamous thesis, at the threshold of modernity, a thesis that he takes from Foucault, this rustic Greek metrical device becomes, in the French, dispositif. A, it's a very difficult thing to translate. It's translated sometimes as apparatus, it's translated as device. And so I won't go into it. It's not, neither translation is actually an action. But Agamben, in his book, employs this notion of a machine, an anthropological machine, that produces on each side what he calls a cesera, both the bestialization of humanity and the animal, the anthropomorphization of the animal. So this is the outcome of what Agamben defines according to his thesis of bare life as the product of the political form of modernity to produce animalization of the human and at least and basically an anthropomorphism or a humanization of the human. So I'm going to uh, press a lot very, uh, very probingly or problematically on this symmetrical kind of thesis. In some ways, it comes from uh, the 19th century understanding of the, bio, the emergence of biology. And it comes from two thinkers, or poets in particular, uh, that, uh, that both, both are cited by Agamben and Heidegger. It comes from Nietzsche, and it comes from Lutka, René Maria Lutka, who define a different kind of animality, but at the basis of what they call the political animalization of man. In the seminar on Parmenides, it refers to, it is referred to as that monstrous anthropomorphization of the animal and a corresponding animalization of humanity. Here we can see the full development of Agamben's vision or version of the biopolitical as a machine for producing even manufacturing in large numbers, populations, herds, in the 
factors in other forms. It is the impoverishment of life itself, which is first found or discovered to be appear on the side of the animal in the famous thesis that the animal is poor or impoverished. Of course, this thesis from Heidegger has been also poorly understood as expressing a certain kind of prejudice towards the animal, a certain kind of anthropocentrism. Even though, as I will argue, in fact, Heidegger says the animal, in fact, does not exist rigorously as a living being. When we say the animal, we are not referring to any living being. There is no such thing as any animal. Okay? Um, if you think about it, there can only be different living beings or different forms of life that are each articulated and singular to their environments or territories. The animal is created as a category to classify all of those. You could say the same problem appears on the side of the human. And uh, you know, so this is, in a sense, the very category that is the notion of the animality. The notion of the animal is a category that emerges as a metaphysical or a taxon taxonomic or epistemological category. In this talk, therefore, I will return to the debate around Heidegger's reduction of non-human animals to what he calls a state of poverty that of having in the mode of not having, or of merely having life and thus not being able to die, only to perish. And this is probably the most problematic statement that Heidegger made, uh, because in a sense, it prefigures or it thinks about the politics of Heidegger himself, which I'll talk about in a moment. But first, I want to recall the full context of the 1929-1930 lecture course that in the three theses, that the stone is worldless, veltlos, the animal is poor in the world, delta, and humans are world forming or world producing, veltlo, are proposed in response. Actually, these are propositions that already respond to the three preliminary questions that he takes up in that seminar, which is what is world, what is finitude, and what is individuation? Is what would individuate all of the forms of life in both of these in the world as a result of these questions? According, as Heidegger says, it is the middle question. In the first instance, what is finitude? And in the second instance, what is an animal or how is the animal related to the world? That in fact is the most important question to pose first. So in the tripart question, it's not by accident in these three propositions. The stone is worldless, the animal is poor in the world or forming or producing, that Heidegger chooses as his path to follow the path of the animal. In other words, the middle path, the middle way, as you might say, uh, um, uh, according to Siddhartha, but and I don't think that Heidegger was thinking of Siddhartha when he said that. So it is the middle thesis concerning the animal that has to be defined first because it is against the minimal accessibility of the animal to territory, to world, to environment, that can set out a path finally for the other two beings to be determined. What is it to be have no access to the notion of environment or world, which is pos posited as the stone? And what is it to be world forming or to have access or relation to world? predisposed or prejudiced in an understanding of what the human being is. Let's also recall that while setting out on the path of the animal in order to finally determine an understanding of what is world, in the end, to ask the question how the human or, or man is world forming, Heidegger actually, and this is something that people don't really comment on or notice, Heidegger gets lost in this seminar. So he sets out on the path of the animal, in order to finally reach the point where he says we can understand what the world is, about halfway through the seminar, he gets lost. He never brings up world again. He can't define what world is. And he abandons the path, abandons the course. So it's most important to think about this, that in the 30s, in the third period of the 29 and the early 30s, that he actually poses a question that we presuppose that he has conclusions or answers for. He has actually a positive definition of what world is. In fact, he never gives positive definition of what world is, not until after World War II, not until after, in a sense, his work with the poets, and basically not until after his passage through his most problematic political period, his association with National Socialism, and his position in Freiburg as the rector of the university, where he officially associates with the Nazis, 
Nazi or the National Socialist propaganda around questions that I think will be importantly related to what we're talking about. He starts out in another patch later on in the period of the 30s, the question of the world becomes completely bound up with the historical question, Geschichte, of the German people in Vogue. A theme which in the black note notebooks which have been published recently revealed is implicitly linked to the Nazi themes of Liebensraum, Liebensraum, the uh, living space, and to the theme of blue and soil, blood and soil, which I will return to below. However, at least from the period beginning 1935, which is the famous rhetoric address, one cannot separate the phenomenal, phenomenological meaning of world from the political and ideological, i.e. spiritual significance that Heidegger gives to the groundedness to Heimat, to the notion of home. So this is very important. I mean, Heidegger, the question of world reigns in relationship to the question of what is a homeland? What is a place or a territory for a historical people? What is the relation of the Germans to the soil? What is the relation of the Greeks to the Greek world? And so all these questions become very important. Thus land, territory, environment, world has an ontological significance as space that allows for the unfolding of basic human possibilities. That is to say, it comprises, first of all, the field, the da, the there of Dasein. As human beings who inhabit the land and dwell in it, they create spaces whose borders do not necessarily coincide with the territorial e or even geographical boundaries. So in other words, there's a relation to space, to territory, to land, that cannot be defined cartologically as maps or a world in that sense. The land constitutes what the Greeks call octathon, a place where humans dwell and create a homeland, Heimat. It is here I might pose, just as an aside, a question that can really lead us to a more sharpened reflection on this passage. Although it is said that animals are presupposed to relate or having a relation to an environment or territory, can it be said that animals have a home in the same way that we predispose to think that humans, whether that homeland is understood as the nation space, as the people, the, the nation soil where the people live, the original or aboriginal place in which the people are related to, do animals have actually a home? In that question, if we were to pursue it more in a seminar format, I think we would find in a very sharpened way somewhat of analogy or correlate how Heidegger is pursuing the question of the world against the backdrop of the animal. So turning back again now to the 1929 seminar, it's here we find the most infamous statement, statement that the animal is poor in the world. It is true that Heidegger restricts the openness of animal life as a captivation of its own organs. Animals are captivated by an environment, by the territory, by immediately a territory which absorbs all of their attention. This is the way that Heidegger defines it in terms of the manifestness of their relation to a particular presence of anything is related to how the, the organs are articulated to grip the environment of the territory. And this comes from the biologist uh, Alexander von Kufsko, for instance, who gives him the famous example, the tick, the tick expresses a peculiar relation of a long duration followed by a relatively short duration of activity and death that defines the peculiar manner of living of this creature. In other words, ticks can there's been an experiment where ticks can be placed in an isolated environment away from a branch, and they can exist two to three years without any nourishment. And then suddenly, they can then come back, reanimate, and be alive in order to suck the blood of an herbivore or a carnivore, in order, and then immediately they die. Okay. So if you think about, this is a crazy animal. Okay. And why? Who would ever invent such an animal? Well, only life. And so this is the question of how you would think about it in a sense, how life and how it articulates the relation and unknown. But here we should recall the translation of the English term peculiar, which is related to the German eigenlich and is derived from the noun eigenlich, property, property. In their translation of Simon Zeitz, McQuarrie and Robinson often employ the term authentic 
which has had some unfortunate consequences that we remember Adorno's scathing critique of what he calls Heidegger's jargon of authenticity, which might be more, actually we might think about authenticity and being authentic in terms of peculiar, in terms of being peculiar, singular, remarkable, standing out in some sort of trait to something or thing. It takes peculiarity of being able to sleep, let's say, or fall unconscious for years, to come alive and then to immediately die on its first meal. Okay, that's peculiar, but it's also remarkable, authentic, proper to the tick. Okay? So, if we associate the notion of peculiarity in terms of, we might think then about Heidegger's peculiar choice of the word or to describe the animal's relation to its world or to an environment. Why does Heidegger at that moment use the word or? And he doesn't compare, it's a comparative thesis, but he doesn't compare it to human. The human is actually not described as wealthy in relation to the world, but only world form. So there's not a symmetry, let's say, between the stone, which is worldless, the animal is poor, but the human, which is world forming. World forming is not necessarily wealth. But we must think about the choice in the relation to, in a sense, the term capital or to property within the context of Heidegger's use of the term property at that moment. Why? Why does Heidegger choose the word poverty to find the animal's relation to the world? As he asks, what is this poverty in the world of the animal? Of course, in the recent scholarship on the animal, many humans have been incredibly offended by the statement on behalf of animals who are described and other non-human forms of life who are being called poor. These include plants, soccer balls, and other objects that in a sense are prejudiced against by Heidegger's statement but in any way, they entertain a poor relation to the world. And yet we must recall that Heidegger is pursuing a major difference between the forms of life from, let's say, a traditional or metaphysical concept in which the animal, as an animal, qua animal, which I said in the beginning of the lecture, does not exist, is defined prim primarily through deprivation. It is deprived of something, deprived of speech, of logos, of soul, of some relation of psyche, of consciousness. So in other words, it is through a traditional metaphysical definition of animality or of the animal. The animal is always defined from the position of deprivation and poverty. So for Heidegger to set out that proposition is to set it out against the background of all of the di different attributes and characteristics that define what an animal is within this tradition, which he wants to deconstruct. Actually, he says it at one point, to deconstruct this notion of what an animal is in order to finally get to the question of what kind of human is. If we can no longer pose the animal as simply an impoverished version of what the human is. So when you pose what an animal is, you're just simply posing a human being and subtracting one attribute in order to get to the animal. And Heidegger says that's, that's not a proper definition of what this living being is. Because in a sense, it does not exist. There is no you know, basically human being that then is in a sense deprived of speech and then basically becomes an animal. That's not even in a sense. If we, for instance, if you pose within the context of disability studies or disability subjects, they actually contest this kind of metaphysical categorization because they would say anybody who cannot speak is an animal. Okay, that is a possibility of traditional metaphysical and you know, logocentric and empirical ways of classifying what human beings are and what is characteristic of human beings. Or they would say, if you don't speak English, you're just babbling. Okay? So in a sense, the word actually from the Greek barbaros, barbaros, where we get barbarian, you know where that word comes from. It comes from the Greek sound of babble in the Greek ear when they're hearing another language being spoken. So a barbarian is anyone who speaks another language from Greek. So anyway, so including animals. Okay, so animals don't speak here either. So let me move down a little bit. How long do I? How long am I supposed to go for? Oh, we have 14 more minutes. Oh, okay. <laughs> if I start speaking, I get excited and I start talking to you. Okay, so we just have to spend a case with so note in the statement where Heidegger actually begins to introduce the notion of the animal against the question of the world or poverty, 
it is a, is a way of problematizing that category of animal or what the animal is, including particularly the animal rationale, the, the human animal, the animal that has speech. But notice in the statement that Heidegger never says the animal is deprived of something definite like speech or language. He says only that the animal is, in a certain sense, deprived of world. But we don't yet know what world it is. We don't know what the animal's world is, nor what the human's world is, what the human produces and falls for. I say this again because it's the concept of world has not been positively defined in this thinking of this point. Nor can it be assumed as something then that is already given, either conceptually, historically, or philosophically. As he says, only where there is a having do we have, can we find the possibility of not having. Therefore, poverty, dep deprivation, is defined by the form of having in the mode of not having. So think of this, all poor have a relation to capital and property in the mode of not having. They lack property or capital, but we pose the value of capital in the relation first of having in order to derive the value of not having. The poor are poor because they do not have enough. Okay? So this is basically Heidegger's argument uh, of the human and the animal. We can pose the animal as a not having only on the basis of the presupposition that humans have something. Okay? Have world. We don't know what world is yet, though. But I wonder, do the rich often from our parents, or basically unless anybody, anybody really rich here, um, if, do the rich, <laughs> don't the rich appear to us like they have more world? That is, they have more possibilities that expand beyond the environment of the territory in which most people live, and that world becomes productive of power that, in a sense, yields its ability to create more world. It is from the position of the rich today, or from the wealthiest populations, that we say the world is being produced or created. So Heidegger is also, at that moment, trying to address the, the, the origin or the emergence of, in a sense, world around this relation that is purely political and economic in its relationship, too, which is why he uses the term poverty. Consequently, the dominant statement that the animal is poor in the world can only be understood from the perspective of a previous metaphysical determination of animality, which causes the animal to appear more or less, as I said, like a poor human being. Except in this case, the animal is found to even be poorer than the poorest of all human beings, because uh, the animal appears both relatively poor and at the same time as absolutely deprived of something. Here, in other words, we find a general definition of animality in Heidegger's analysis referring to a peculiar being that exists on the scale between the mere possibility of having access or relation to the world and being absolutely deprived. So we can think of animality along that scale in which humans are also then placed in that scale as well. And that's the relation of the human and animalization of the human. It's a scale of having and not having in a sense, classifies all living beings according to that scale. But there is not just those two terms. It is not the same thing, for instance, where I said a minute ago that the human is not defined as wealthy in the world, but only as world farming, a world producing. We don't know what that means yet. And I'll, I'll give a definition of what it actually means. Which is not the same thing as saying being wealthy as a species. In fact, when compared not to the animal, but to what Heidegger says, life in general, the human is, by contrast, not simply poor, but absolutely impoverished. That's what Heidegger says. He says at one moment, that in comparison to life, uh, the human being is completely impoverished. In other words, it doesn't have the capacity or the diversity to create um, all of the very various beings like the tick. You know, we can't, we don't, we're not creative enough or imaginative enough to create even a tick. Okay? If we thought about it, I mean, the tick is a beautiful creature, but we're too stupid as a species to actually go out and create it. Okay? So it's an interesting comment in that way. We can't create plants that actually eat flies. Okay? But in a sense, life can imagine these things. And this is, in a sense, Heidegger's point is life is this incredible um, creative diversity experience that we can do. Okay. So, at this point, I want to skip then to the conclusion of a very long exposition 
of Heidegger's seminar, I simply ask the following question. What is an environment that is peculiar to man, to the human? What is, what is, does the human have a relation to an environment at all? I ask this because Heidegger chooses to call the environment in which the human dwells the world. But the world has not a real definite relation to the environment. The world is an indefinite, abstract, expanding, and large understanding of spatiality that doesn't have any particular territory of its own. Is formed by what Heidegger calls an expression of an illuminated it is, it is through, for instance, the animal, what, what is an environment, is produced or created through the eliminative character of what constitutes an environment, umwelt, or territory. For instance, it is first produced as a form of an encirclement, which is brought about, ergun, in relation to the continual production of an emptiness where the particular species of living being lives. So for instance, we can understand the production of an emptiness, for example, is the air where the bird flies. Okay. Bird flies through the air. It is the ocean where the fish swims. This is the de definite determination of what is an environment or a territory. It is a particular kind of emptiness that is articulated singularly to that living being. You can't pick up a fish out of the ocean like you can't think of a bird without the air. So, this is it. so the question is, in terms of our meditation, there is no environment that is peculiar, singular to the human being. Because you find humans on the ocean, <coughs> under the ocean, in the air, in outer space, in other, on other planets. Okay, so this is, of course, the meditation that Heidegger is trying to, in a sense, prepare for. But he doesn't really develop until later on in the question concerning technology. At the same time, we must recognize this, that the more that our species widens our circle, our environment, our world, producing new manners of populating the emptiness in which we dwell, the more the human species encircles other species and other living beings and incorporates them into our own circle of life, which means that these other beings and species become biopolitically, this is the determination of biopolitics, incorporated into the emptiness that we produce as a, as a part or as an expression of our own expansion and as our own power over life itself, the determination of life itself. But this is, in a sense, a very succinct determination of what biopolitical is. It is through the expansion, the creation or production of an emptiness that becomes associated with the capturing and the production of animal life, human life, plant life, and other life, within the emptiness in which we dwell. That emptiness is also the emptiness internal to our own bodies, the ability and the right we have to eat other animals, to produce animals and plants, to consume them. It is, in a sense, a, fun a fundamental relation of emptiness to the environment, the reproduction of the environment of what, which our species dwells. So you could say that the animal body is only there already belongs to the emptiness that is defined by the human production. In other words, the animal that lives in the farm is already empty, already part of the digestive system of another species. So we think of that emptiness of that inside and outside as fundamentally related to that anthropological machine that I began with, with uh, Agamemnon. Thus, the emptiness is now determines the animal to live within our encirclement, and the animal can be slaughtered and eaten, because its being is reduced to emptiness, the human needs this emptiness in order to live and to produce its own existence. It becomes a justification for eating, and soon the very condition for the existence of certain animals that are mass produced as so much empty space in which the human dwells. I think we have arrived now at a point of understanding what Heidegger calls world producing, the animal human is world producing, that is productive of a certain emptiness that is proper to our species life, the determination of our species life. Which is why we have no proper environment, because in a sense we encircle all other environments and produce in those environments an emptiness in which we dwell. The human as world producing defines a particular form of life that encircles every other living thing, thereby reducing them to the emptiness to which our own life is brought about and even increases its power over life itself in the struggle against this life. 
even our increasing knowledge of cellular biology is part of a very aggressive process of struggle against life itself in order to defend our species against a form of creativity that is much more prodigious and much more terrifying. It is, in a sense, the life in general, generality that defines our, pro our problem of uh, peculiarity of our species and its struggle. This is terms that will appear later on in Heidegger, and it's certainly problematic around the question of technology in Heidegger, the breeding of human beings, the breeding of human populations, the breeding of animals, and so forth, becomes part of what he calls this complete technology, technological encirclement or gestalt, the enframement. What would this imply if Heidegger's formulation of animality prepares us to understand the contemporary biopolitical framing of non-human and animal life that can be allowed to end or perish since the manner in which animal life, uh, the manner in which animal life appears never stands out, never becomes peculiar in terms of the question of its own proper or its own peculiar access to its world. It's only posed in the frame of the human problem of access, or even the ethical problem of human consumption, production, or animals. So it appears even that the animal's life is posed as a question only within the frame of our biopolitical frame, and not within the question of the animal's own proper or related frame. I think we've come to a point now where we can ask the following question, which I will first pose in towards the conclusion now in the manner of a goblin, and then in the conclusion according to the philosophy, not of Heidegger, but of Whitehead. Is it this emptiness, which now I transpose in order to retranslate the term open, which is too fetishistically and too peacefully employed? The notion of what is it open, what is it opening, what is it what is what is it clearing of being? It's always posed in this metaphorical way that it's kind of like Really nice, pleasant thing on a Sunday afternoon when you go out in the field and there's a clearing of being. No, what we're posing the question of the open is more the production of an emptiness or a biopolitical frame, which is not peaceful or is peaceful only when the question of life is fundamentally decided against or for a certain kind of being. Again, according to Agamben's thesis, it is the emptiness that's produced by the anthropological machine. And even the bodies of animals are emptied out in order to be incorporated in becoming the space where humans dwell. But does man, and this is my question, does the human actually ever first produce this emptiness itself? Where does the emptiness come from? The human produces or places the emptiness or this notion of an opening into a machine, having access to other living beings through knowledge or biology, being able to take power over animals and so forth. These are, this is an openness that is already granted, it appears, to a certain being called human or man, but the, it is never created by our species. We only imitate an openness that we already find in nature. This is the philosophy of life. In other words, the human does not recreate this emptiness ex nihilo, interesting theological illusion, but rather produces it on the basis of what nature or life first provides as an opening into other living species. We take charge, we administer, we dispose, we, we take charge of the codes of living, even through our biology and through our genetic knowledge. It is here that Agamben wants to include or homogenize this openness mechanistically to cause it to become a machine in order to drive what is the anthropological energy that the human uh, society derives from. That is to say, poverty in the world in which the animal, and this is Agamben's quote, in which the animal in some way feels its not, own not being open. Now, this is the most speculative moment in Agamben. Agamben says that he affirms Heidegger's notion of poverty because he says in the animal poverty, he poses that the animal feels its own finitude in relation to what? Is it something, so if you go and look at an animal, you can say, well, the animal is suffering from a certain kind of finitude. It's feeling its own finitude with regard to a relation to the a do, more dominant uh, relation to man, which has a strategic function of assuring a passage between the animal environment and the open, which I call emptiness, from the perspective in which captivation 
is the essence of the animal as a background in which the essence of humanity can be now set out, meaning politically in fact, by the world. So again, the thesis, uh, Gandhi's thesis concerning animality is simply an extension and a double down of, in a sense, a metaphysical thesis of the animal which does not exist. Because in the metaphysical thesis, the animal is just posited as a being deprived of one thing. Now, the animal poverty is the, back, the entire background out of which the essence of what constitutes humanity can be posed as a political question. But first, we have to produce the animal as impoverished life, or as a being that is impoverished. So let me conclude by going down. Uh, I've kind of like resisted that. I want to go to Heidegger, I mean, to, um, to Whitehead, just to conclude. In the time that remains, in order to determine the completely different character of this open, or this empty, that is non-Heideggerian and thus non-Agambian as well. I wanted to turn to the philosophy of Heide Heide uh, Whitehead, even though I could also turn to the biology of Kangyam, George Kangyam, as I've done elsewhere in my other writings. In both cases, the open is defined precisely as the relation between a living society and its environment, any environment, whatever. The openness is the tension or the imbalance of the relation between any living organization, any living being, and its environment. And that openness emerges as a struggle for the organism, organism to maintain a fragile homeostasis, unity, in relation to an environment which is constantly threatening or hostile. It is hostile to that Simply the biological fact. If you think about viruses, we live in an environment of, populated by millions of other organisms and living beings, and the problem of life, the problem of homeostasis, the problem of the unity of the form of life, is always posed in maintaining in the struggle our own unity in relation to the other living beings that constitute our environment. The open is there never empty. It's always filled with differentiations that sometimes attack and begin to change the organism. And it's that problem that we're constantly posing in terms of Zika. We're posing that always, you know, we're always struggling, and science is part of that, let's say, struggle as well. In the third part of process and reality, or actually in the final part, Whitehead had a thesis or a proposition that could also say we could pose it in relation as a counterexample to the notion of the animal's core. The proposition was life is robbery. Life is robbery. What is robbery? It's because the statement appears truncated next to the complete, it's, it's, it occurs in a section which describes what he calls the nature of nature itself, the life itself. The nature of nature is robbery. The nature of nature is theft and counter theft between a living society and the environment that is composed of living other societies, both organic and human. Now let me just explicate this in terms of what um, basically Whitehead says in terms of what is the order of nature. A living society is situated in an environment of other societies, both organic and intermediate. According to Whitehead, the fundamental law of nature is robbery, which is then reactively adapted by living societies into the form or the structure of a hierarchy. We have to justify, we have to create an order out of chaos or out of anarchy. And so we have to create, as an understanding of the relation between our living society or one living society and another, a certain kind of legalized robbery, ordered, structured robbery, which then becomes the basis for our biology and our scientific knowledge. Of course it's okay for the animal to go out and eat, you know, basically the coyote will go into your yard and eat the cat. That's what a coyote does. That's an example of justification of well. But in more and more complex and hierarchically arranged living societies, this problem of eating, when we say robbery, what Whitehead is actually talking about is the problem of eating. The problem that any living society has is that it must rob other living societies, both plants, animals, objects and organic for its food. And in doing so, it has to do so with the <coughs> principle that structures its own organic life and its own blood. So here we say that the most problematic point in Whitehead is around the nature of God as the ultimate principle or justification for love. That is, a principle that justifies the creation or the right of one species to select one species' right to eat 
over another species' right to be free. For example, as an aside, what both Nietzsche and Roca each define as the monstrous animalization of man, according to a 19th century biologist, or what Adamant proposed as bear life, are both essentially forms of justifying robbery, even explaining the basis of a biopolitical right of negative terms. In other words, their life is a way of explaining that this principle of robbery is put into place mechanically machined, and therefore it's what doesn't justify ethically, but it becomes the very problematic question of the right one living society has over another in terms of what it produces. Finally, and this is where I'll conclude, an equally pressing problem. Finally, an equally pressing problem concerns which is the following. If the relationship between living societies or between a living society's environment, which is composed of organic and inorganic societies, is only mediated by this theft and counter theft, this act of eating or this act of production of robbery, then does the restriction, the repression of this eating, this violence, actually result in a loss of the relation between the society and its environment? This is one of the things that I've right there poet. The less we eat, the more we eat, the more we learn about the world. The less we eat, the less we understand about the world. So these are all problematic, and this is why I wanted to pose them in terms of these are good things to think about in terms of our question. Would the restraint or containment of eating result in a weakened or anorexic society or organism terms of its relation to the, its own environment or to the world. If robbery is the only means of my relation to the environment, basically to other societies that compose my milieu. Now, remember, I'm posing this, these are really problematic because you could say, oh, well, life is robbery, so I have a right to eat anything I want. That's precisely Whitehead's point. If you think about framing of ethical discourse, it is a discourse of right, the right to eat, or the right to justify on the basis of the species' right to live, what kind of decisions are made with regard to other living beings that control this environment? You can pose that negatively or positively. You can pose it critically in terms of veganism or vegetarianism as a way of restraining a previous state of the proposition of right or on the principle that life is robbery. But all of those statements are responding to that determination of nature. According to Whitehead, therefore, life functions as a catalyst as a catalyst of a living relationship between one society, between a living society and its environment. Even though this catalyst is a kind of robbery or an illegal entry or a kind of problem of criminality. In other words, we're always positing our relation to the environment in terms of a problem, a moral problem, a methodical problem. That we, in fact, introduce into the relation to the environment as well as a species. It is only by robbing other societies that I live even more. It is only the act of robbery that one living society is actually related to another. In a certain sense, if I wasn't robbing a uh, society or being robbed by another society, I wouldn't have any basis for of that society, any relation. This truism will have important implications for science, our knowledge of the world on the one hand, and theology, our knowledge of God on the other. One could go far as to say that science would not have any predisposition to explore the environment composed of organic and non-organic societies if this relationship was not already set up, produced by that emptiness that is produced by the act of already robbing the societies for its food. Science basically comes as a reactive, a reaction to the act of eating already. Okay, that our knowledge of something, so it's like, it's kind of like George Bush and the Iraq War. You know, basically, you first invade another country, and then you learn that the country exists. Okay, so this is, the, this is a certain way that science also retroactively relates itself through knowledge to a species or an understanding of the organism to the environment. In which we live. This is, here again to quote Whitehead, the robber requires justification. This is the greatest and most intensive thought. Recalling our earlier example of the offended society who seeks to rob the robber of intensity, the same principle can be found to operate in the drive to cure cancer or any number of human diseases, as if to capture the intensity or the vivid immediacy of those living of that forms of life is, in a sense, the most is posed in terms 
of a problem of just whether cancer is justified in its eating of a living living organization of a human being. And this has also been posed in the ethical discourse that we're talking about. You know, if you want to say that life is absolutely justified and you don't need to think, then you have to say that, okay, well, that cancer, you know, basically should take its course in any living organism. But if you can't, then the problem of that justification emerges as the greatest moral problem of power. Yes. In doing so, in finding a cure or inoculation, does science reduce the virus to the status of food? Yes. But only to the degree that knowledge is also a kind of food that is knowing how to destroy or separate a particular living society from its own power, from its own prodigious creation, that this living society will, in a sense, be subordinated to the life of the living organization of another. So this is the last paragraph. In other circumstances, this attribute does not appear, first of all, as a positive characteristic, but rather as something negative or improper, as an intruder or a dangerous predator, as a viral output. Perhaps this expresses its position in relation to our consciousness of our living society, in which we are always grasping the entrance of an intruder or an interloper from the position of something that is threatened. Does this imply that the human society perceives life, life itself, as not part of our own society? This is the most interesting question. Life always comes, and this is Whitehead's point, life always appears as an outsider that doesn't belong or doesn't care particularly about our organization as a species, our living organization as a society. In fact, God could love cancer more than he loves human beings. <laughs> what is, strictly speaking, death, but an event when life robs a particular living society of its own satisfaction, according to white man, and reduces it again to the status of food? Rather, what is improper reveals is the perception of a supreme apathy. Life is inhuman, not for us, but for itself. Whitehead even ends and says, life craves only its own intensities in each living and actual occasion, including the occasion of illness, what we call the occasion of illness, life desires. And it's the intensity of its desire that we find so great. Okay? It is this. When we see that intensity, though, is indifference. Life doesn't care. It's cruel. It doesn't care about it. It's violent. It is this indifference that is wrongly depicted as cruelty or as malign evil that reveals our reaction of terror in the face of life as being fundamentally a stranger, and which makes us fear it absolutely. Death, the absolute master, not at all. Life. However, it does no good to correct the misnomer by substituting the term life for death either. Here we might recall, and this is how I'll end, the fragment that originally appeared in Heraclitus. To the bow, the bow, belongs the name of life. Bios, which is in Heraclitus, Bios. To the bow belongs the name of life. But its work is death. Thank you.